clear that this is actually part of a community art plant series. So we had our first workshop uh, last month focusing on plant identification and collection. And in a moment, I will pop a link into the chat if you would like to view the recording from that workshop and see all of the resources that were shared, you can do so. And there's also opportunity to sign up for the third workshop where we're focusing on botanical illustration. And my colleague Isabel, who is here, is actually leading that workshop. Isabel, do you want to say a few words about what we can expect for that one in June? Yeah, sure. So June 16th, we'll, um, I'll be going over some botanical illustration techniques. And in this workshop, you will learn how to illustrate plants. And I'm going to go over how to draw plants and the importance of highlighting uh, features of plants. And then um, it's a follow along session. So if you want to follow along, you can either just do the drawing portion or you can do drawing and watercolor. So things that you will need to prepare um, are paper and pencil, um, preferably watercolor paper if you are going to be um, using watercolor paints. And, um, or you can follow along with pencil crayons um, if that's your preference. Uh, so you'll need watercolor paper, brushes, pencil eraser, tissue and water. And yeah, hopefully you guys will come and join in on that. It should be fun. Yeah, and anybody is welcome to attend these workshops. They're free and any ages are really um, welcome to join. And the second part of this community art plant series is that we'll be developing a guidebook on local plants. So some invasive, some edible, some native. And so any participants or really residents of the region who want to submit artwork for inclusion in the guidebook are welcome to do so. And I'll be sending out a message after the workshop series has completed about how to do that. So if you learn some really great techniques tonight and take some great photos or do some artwork, um, those are the kinds of submissions we want to see in, in the guidebook. So kind of created by uh, community artists. So just a little bit about our council, if you are new to attending one of our events, we are a not-for-profit organization established in 2006, and our job is to help educate people and support people that are working on invasive species issues. So we answer questions, connect people to resources, we host regional events and develop resources that may be helpful if you are battling invasives on your property or as a volunteer. Um, we do a lot of training and supporting of staff and volunteers who are out there doing a lot of the work in the region. And we have a really small seasonal field crew as well. So there's a number of ways you can keep in touch with us and I welcome you to contact us after today. If you have any questions, you can visit our website. You can see the link there. If you are on social media, so are we. You can find us on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram. And if you're super keen to learn about events like this that are coming up, we also have a regional listserv. So we send out sort of quarterly e-newsletters and that's a great way to find out about invasive species news or events or even job opportunities that are coming up. And finally, before we get into the core of our workshop for tonight, I would like to thank the Vancouver Board of Parks and Recreation and the Neighborhood Matching Fund Program, which is funding the, the workshops and the series. So I'm gonna stop sharing. And I'm gonna invite our presenter, Crystal, as I'm introducing her to get her uh, PowerPoint loaded up so she's ready. But it is my, my great pleasure that we have Crystal Coughlin Silverfox joining us tonight. She is an artist of the Selkirk First Nation living and working in New Westminster. She received a Bachelor of Fine Arts from the University of BC and a Master of Fine Arts from SFU. Her work has been presented in group exhibitions, including those at the Surrey Art Gallery, Power Plant in Toronto, Polygon Gallery in North Vancouver, the Yukon Art Centre in Whitehorse, Gallery Gachet in Vancouver. Crystal has received numerous grants from the Canadian Council for Arts and participated in residencies at the Malaspina Printmakers, Vancouver, Malaspina Printmakers in Vancouver, the Naminga Institute, the Museum of North Arizona Flagstaff and the Kwanlin Dunn Cultural Center in the Whitehorse. So she's um, had tons of experience as a professional photographer and I'm so excited that she's here tonight. I, I take a lot of 
plant photos in my work, um, but I've never been formally trained. And so I'm really looking forward to having some, some tips so that I can get better at doing that. Hi, hey everyone. Thank you. Thank you so much for that wonderful introduction. Um, I am sharing my screen now. Hopefully you guys are getting this. Come on, pop up. There we go. Yep, it looks, <laughs> looks great, hey. Crystal. So uh, I'd like to first start by acknowledging that I am living, working, and playing on the unceded Coast Salish territories of the Key Kite First Nation, which is located in Westminster, BC. And um, I really do acknowledge that, or I would um like everyone to acknowledge where they are on wherever they are on this planet just and like think about the history the plants <laughs> think about where you are and how you can connect anyway i like to move on and start with this wonderful little uh, workshop talking about photography but um i'd like to first start by saying uh i have a my background in photography it started just being a hobby photographer. I actually um, started, I'd say like 20 years ago, I had a little bit of money. So I bought a really cheap um, like film camera, a single lens reflex camera. I had no idea how to take photos. So I spent, or I wasted a ton of money on film, which is kind of ridiculous now because we have digital, digital photography. So anyway, I would like to start by saying I'm such a passionate photographer. I just I can't stop taking photos. It's almost like when I look back through my albums on my phone or through my um, my albums on my <laughs> on my computer, it's like I can actually see not only what I'm experiencing through time, like all my experiences, but I can also see like um, people grow people and plants growing around me, and that's um, really wonderful. So anyway, on with this wonderful presentation. So I'd like to start by asking why. <laughs> why would you want to take photos of plants? So I have a whole bunch of reasons why. First, of all, first off, if we're um, talking about uh, making a book identifying plants, it would be really important to learn how, how to identify plants through photos. I actually am a gardener. So um, one of the things I actually got recently was a packet of seeds that um, it was like a mixed pack of, I don't know, um, garden greens or something like that. And I planted all the seeds and it had a whole bunch of mysterious lettuces growing up. And so what I wanted to know was what I was actually growing. And because it was just like a random mix of seeds, I actually had to rely on photography and using um, apps to identify the plants. And like what one of the plants that I was really interested in was um, Queen's, Queen's and Queen Anne's lace, which is a wild carrot, it has these like really amazing, like awesome leaves. And it's very interesting. Anyway, um, another one would be documentation. So I'm thinking how you can document plants through time. <laughs> you can see how your plants are growing seasonally, um, doing research. So if you're a botanist, if you are a gardener, if you're a farmer, like if you're just generally interested in learning more about medicinal plants, food safety, all sorts of different reasons why you'd want to do research and do plant photography. And then my personal favorite obviously is artistic. So I like to use um, the plant photos for not only for the photos themselves, but I'd like to use them for collages. I like to think about them <laughs> um, at, like in my painting or my printmaking. I feel like plants are a really great way to kind of ground yourself and really speak to the where you are at like locationally. And then obviously just plants are cool, general interest. Who doesn't want to take a picture of a cool plant? Hey, look at this. It's a beautiful rose, you know? So, uh, and these are daisies. I just took this a couple of days ago because it was like so beautiful and oh my God. It's getting warm outside, guys. We have to go outside. We have to go take photos of plants. It is that time of the year. So let's take photos of plants. What makes a great photograph? So obviously, first thing is good lighting. You're not gonna wanna go take a photo of a plant in the middle of the night. It's not gonna work. Well, maybe, but no. You want to have a nice, clear subject. So you want to be able to see the plant. 
you want to be able to see the color and contrast. This is really important because some plants have um, um, variegated leaves. They have like very subtle colors that may be purple in them. You want to actually be able to show the, the colors accurately if you want to do plant identification or if you're like exploring how to do it like artistically, you might want to have like beautiful purple watercolors. Um, <clears throat> you want to think about the form and content. So when people look at the photo, they know what it is, they can identify it. Um, and also it looks aesthetically pleasing to them. So, and also framing that the last one go, the last two go together, form content and framing. So how it's, how everything's laid out in the image, is there symmetry? Is it um, like, I don't know, rule of thirds? Do you guys, is it cropped down? So it's like very, very detailed. These are really um, all sorts of things. So there's a lot to think about with photography. So. Okay, so um, I'm thinking specifically that we are looking at outdoor photography right now. So when you um, are doing outdoor photography, there are four main types of light that you want to be careful of. So direct, direct sunlight. So if your subject is in the direct sun, you're going to have very bright whites, very black blacks. It's gonna be um, not very many levels between the lightest color and the darkest color in that photograph. So it's going to be, uh, yeah, just, very, it has a high impact when you look at it, it's just bam, there's that, there's that photo. Cloudy and overcast days, they provide softer shadows and un uniform lighting. This is actually the perfect type of weather for photos of plants. This is what photographers call nature's softbox. It makes perfect, I'd say portrait photos even, everything looks very nice, all the colors are, very flattering, everything is just so perfect. It is the, it's amazing. Just every time it's cloudy, go outside and take some photos. Um, and then there's my least favorite, which is shade photography. I do not like shade photography, photography because although you can do it, it won't have the same um, high contrast as being in direct sunlight. I don't like it because it often skews your colors. So everything will kind of have a blue tint. Um, color correction is a lot more challenging. It's not ideal if you're going to be taking photos of plants. And then lastly is the golden hour. So the golden hour is the first hour of daylight and, and the last hour of daylight. So I think the sun rose <laughs> around like, 5.30 in the morning this morning. So it would be 5.30 to 6.30 would be the perfect hour. And, or like uh, 7.50 to 8.50 PM. So having that kind of bracket of between day and night has nice, really soft lighting. The light tends to be more warm, which is very, it's welcoming when you're doing plant photography. It has like this, I don't know, this magic feeling to it. It, um, I would say the golden hour is also a photographer's favorite light. So nice, beautiful, cloudy, overcast days and the golden hour. I know when you get like these beautiful sunny days, you're like, I wanna go take photos of plants outside. <laughs> yes, go do it, but um, any weather, it, it works. So here's an example of shade you'll see that uh, the greens in the background, they're very blue, and as well as the, the purples, the whole image is skewed a lot blue. So this is a cloudy image, and you'll see that the shade or the shadows, they're, they're very subtle. They kind of like, they, they subtly turn into darker area. S subtly, not suddenly, subtly turn into darker areas. All the colors are very like they're bright. They're so direct sunlight. The whites are super white and the darks are super dark. And then you have a little bit of range in the middle, but it's not it's not a lot. 
So this is really hard because you don't really have a lot of detail in the, in the light or dark parts. So you're kind of give, giving up the detail to have this very like dramatic image. And then the golden hour, everything looks very yellow, orange, warm. It has that feeling of sunset. It's just, um, it almost has like a, I don't know, a mystical feeling. So to get the proper exposure for your images, which is the most important thing to get the good light is to make sure that your images are not overexposed or underexposed. So that to change your exposure, it really depends on the type of camera you have. So if you have a smartphone, a tablet, or a point and shoot camera with a, with a touch screen, you can touch the screen, it'll pop up a little box. And then there'll be a slider on the side. If you like hold your finger on there, if you slide it up, it makes the picture brighter. If you slide it down, it makes the picture darker. That's how you can adjust the exposure through the touch screens. So with DSLR, or, um, DSLR, SLRs, and mirrorless cameras, they're more complicated. You can you have to use three different um, functions to control the exposure. So that would be the aperture, which is the f-stop, the shutter speed, and the ISO. So you want to have a perfect balance between the three of them to have the perfect exposure. So if you don't have enough, let's say, um, enough <laughs> ISO, like your ISO is very low, then you're going to want to, um, and your picture keeps coming out dark, you're going to want to push the other ones up to kind of compensate for that one, the one low. It's kind of like having a triangle and having all the pieces perfectly fit together to support and have a nice, perfectly lit image. So I'm gonna get more into this. I know it's really, it's a lot of stuff. It's kind of boring, let's get into it. So this is an overexposed image, it's way too bright. You can't get the details in it. If you want to go post-production and try to pull out details and darken it, it's not gonna look as great as, as you could have it if it were properly exposed, but it would still perhaps work. And then this is underexposed. It's, it's way too dark. It doesn't look good. Um, yeah, this would be easier to work with post-production, you know, working with Photoshop, editing the photo, it'd be easier to bring up the lights in this image than it would be to bring in the darks with this image. So that's something to keep in mind. If you have to choose between having an overexposed or an underexposed picture, always go underexposed. And then the, per, the proper exposure would have darks and lights and it would be like a nice balance between the two. <clears throat> okay, so this is a little bit technical, so bear with me. Okay, so DSLR, SLR and mirrorless cameras. Um, okay, so it stands for a, DSLR stands for Digital Single Lens Reflex Camera. So single lens reflex means that there is a, um, a mirror and, okay, actually, sorry. Let me start over. These are cameras that have interchangeable lens and body systems. So for example, I have a DSLR right here. There is a body and then there is a lens. You can remove the lens and body apart. So there are two pieces and you can attach different lenses to the body. Or you can have um, a, a collection of, an amazing, of amazing lenses and then you can upgrade your body. So like these are um, professional uh, cameras. And then you have the newer version of this, which is a mirrorless. So with the DSLR, how it works is there's a mirror inside the camera. So when you look through the, the um, viewfinder, you can, the mirror reflects through the lens. So you can see through the lens, through the whole, like the viewfinder. With a mirrorless, they don't have the mirror in there. So when you take a photo with a DSLR, you have, the mirror has to be removed for the sensor to be exposed. So how this works is there's a motor inside that will flip the mirror up 
expose the, the sensor and then flip it back down. So that's how uh, DSLR, SLR works. So a mirrorless gets rid of the mirror altogether. So you, you essentially see through your, your viewfinder, which is a screen, exactly what your sensor is gonna see. It doesn't have the extra moving parts. It, it makes for smaller camera bodies and it's essentially uh, the, the new um, professional camera these days. So a lot of people who are looking to buy new cameras go for the mirrorless option because they're easy, easier to carry around without having to like have a five pound camera in your bag. So um, there are three main functions like I mentioned for taking a um, photo with a DSLR, SLR or a mirrorless camera. That would be the aperture, which is also called the f-stop. That controls how much is in focus, the depth of field. So it will, if you want to take a photo of let's say a foreground, a middle ground and a background, you will want to have a large depth of field. So all three of those areas are in focus. However, if you want to focus on a very small area, like one leaf, like a, a flower, not the background, not, not the middle ground, but just the foreground, the, the subject, then you want to have a low depth of field. So a low depth of field would be called also a, a small aperture. And then a large depth of field would have a large aperture. So the aperture is how much the, um, the lens opens to let in light. So every time you take a photo, the lens will open, like allowing so much light in or not. And so that is really important if you want to have like something very specific in focus. The second thing is the shutter speed. So the shutter speed determines how long the sensor is being exposed to light. And that also determines how much time is being captured. So if you're, let's say doing, sports photography, you want to have a very fast shutter speed to capture um, like people running because they're moving really fast. If you wanted to have like a bunch of blurs, then you would have a, show, a slow shutter speed because the camera would open and whatever happens when the camera's open gets recorded onto the sensor and that makes for blurry images. And then lastly is the ISO. So the ISO is the, how sensitive the, the sensor and the film is to light. So the higher the ISO means the more sensitive to light the filter or not filter, the, the film or the sensor is. So low ISO would be best for um, sunny, very bright days. High ISO would be ideal for really dark rooms, night photography. Yeah, um, but also it sounds like it's ISO has like a whole bunch of perks to it because it can, uh, it's more sensitive to light. However, it's um, a lot of grain. So it makes your colors less vibrant. It gives like a fuzziness. It kind of just takes away from the, the sharpness of your image. So I'm gonna get into these next. Okay, so on the left is a slow shutter speed and on the right is a fast sh shutter speed. So one thirteenth of a second versus one one hundredth of a second. So you can see that the one thirteenth of a second because the, the shutter was open for longer, it has a more of a blur. This is something to keep in mind if you're taking photos outside of plants and it's really windy and you're like, why aren't any of these photos working? You might want to have a, a really fast shutter speed if it's windy. So this is ISO. So this is how sensitive the sensor or film is to light. So um, they look the same. The, the images here look the same. They, they both are 
pretty clear, properly exposed, but the ISO is different. So on the, on the left, it's 400 ISO. That would be ideal if you're going to be outdoors. Um, on the right is 6,400 ISO, which would be ideal for dark rooms. And then when we look up close, you can see the image on the left, the, all the colors are much smoother. And the image on the right, you can see the graininess, the, the edges are a little bit more blurry. It's not as clear. And so this is the f-stop, so the aperture. This is how much um, is in focus. Like I was saying, do you want to have the um, foreground, middle ground, and background all in focus, or do you want to have just like the flower in focus, the, the subject? So on the left, oh, sorry, on the left, it's uh, 1.8, sorry, not 1.6, it's 1.8. And then on the right, it's 22. So these would, these are called, these numbers are called F stops. So what's your F stop? It's 1.8, or I have an F stop of 22. So that's how you would refer to F stop. All right, so <clears throat> smartphones, tablets, and point and shoot cameras, um, these are all amazing devices. And it's really uh, difficult because a lot of people are like, oh, this is better than the other end, <laughs> there's so many different versions out there. So I'm just going to give a very basic and generalized summary of how these items work. So um, these devices were um, made specifically so people could take photos really quickly. So you don't have to stop and think about all the settings. So you, it's, you can pull your camera out anywhere and take a photo. And I love that, that's just, I remember like 10 years ago having to carry around like a, a clunky camera and well, I guess that camera, but um, clunky camera. And when my phone, when I got my phone, I was just like, wow, it's like having like a, a little tiny camera. And it's probably the equivalent of like some of these SLRs out there. So they are amazing devices. I would not say that they're any less better. So. The basic controls to use these devices is to have the, um, the slider to control the exposure. So it might be up or down on like Apple. And I think Android has the up and down. And then some of them have like sliders left and right. So um, in the plus side, it would be overexposed. In the minus side, it would be underexposed. And essentially that is same across the board. These devices usually come with um, HDR photography, which stands for high dynamic range. High dynamic range photography is ideal for landscapes. So high dynamic range is essentially like the human eye. The human eye is able to see the sky and the ground at the same time. So when we have, um, when we take a photo, well, the cameras aren't as good as the human eye. So they have to choose do I want to see the ground or do I want to see the sky? So HDR kind of gets rid of that whole like A or B. It combines two images into one. So you can see the sky and the ground at the same time. So essentially HDR, HDR is great for um, getting a range, high dynamic range of like darks and lights. Okay, so I um, think that I can't really see because uh, there's a thing on the side, but I'm pretty sure it says burst photos underneath. So burst photos, that is a mode where um, your camera will take a whole bunch of photos as long as you hold down the shutter button. And the idea is, so let's say you're trying to record your friend jumping in the air. You want to hold down the burst photo throughout the jump, and then you can go through those photos and decide which photo is the best. So burst records time really quickly. And that is similar, but it's different to live photos. So live photos is, I believe, a, an Apple thing. It is 
um, a video recording um, along with a, a photo. So it's a little bit of both. It's not like a burst photo where it's a whole bunch of different photos. It is one single photo wrapped around a, vi a video. So before you even push down on the button to take a live photo, it already records. So it knows um, like the, the moment. It, it, it records moments to kind of have like a little mini video rather than to have like a succession of snapshots. And then now, of course, everyone knows that filters are a big thing, especially with Instagram. So um, a lot of these cameras now come with different kinds of filters. And um, a lot of these filters actually can coincide with this next point, which is that a lot of this new software can include things like ISO, weight balance, um, different uh, different um, types and ranges of photography. So I believe that they have now like um, the newer Apple phones have like the three cameras and um, they each camera has like a different focus. So like one of them will be for macro photography and one of them will be for um, landscape photography, but then they can all work together to have like, um, I don't know, more complex images. And then there's also digital zoom which is essentially um, optical zoom is using lenses, like using, like imagine you having glasses or binoculars to enlarge an image. Uh, that's optical zoom. Digital zoom is when um, the software looks at a piece of the image on the sensor and like synthetically blows it up, just fills in the gaps and makes it bigger. So you won't have the best looking images with a digital zoom, but they've come a long way <laughs> in the last 20 years. And um, yeah, when I'm using macro, which is the next one, sometimes I use the, the digital zoom to kind of get a closer look at what I'm trying to focus on. <clears throat> so focus and range, it refers to the clarity of the image. This is very much related to um, the aperture as well, so how much focus or what the depth of field is in the image. So having a photo in focus means that it is sharp, it is clear and it is easy to identify the subject. So there are three different types of focus. There's automatic focus. So automatic focus is your camera um, focuses on the object once and that's how it focuses, it just, fo it just does a, uses its sensor, it focuses, that's it, once. Continuous focus is, this, is an automatic focus, but it continuously moves with the subject. So let's imagine you're taking a photo of a bird in the sky. Um, if you use automatic focus, it will focus on the bird once. And then if the bird comes closer or further, it could be out of focus that easy. But if you're using continuous focus, the camera will track the bird and change its focus to continuously make sure that the bird is sharp and clear. And then there's manual focus. So that would be like using a DSLR, SLR or mirrorless camera where you have to manually um, focus on the area. You have to like, yeah, you have to line everything up yourself. So the, like I said, the range of focus is highly determined by the aperture, which is also called the f-stop. And the range, so how close of a focus you can get or how far depends on the lens and the focal length. So I have a, right here, I, I have a eight, 18 to 135 millimeter, um, camera lens. And so that means the closest I can get 18 millimeters, I'd say is about 18 centimeters away from me. That's the closest, closest range. And then the furthest, like, um, the furthest is 135, which it's, it's pretty far. So like when you're actually zoomed in, it's like, it's, it's pretty far. 
And then macro photography. Um, it is allowing you to take photos of really tiny, small areas with super high detail. So it kind of like enlarges it and makes it look um, super crisp and amazing. So I'm gonna get into macro photography. So the way you can identify macro photography on your cameras is with that little flower icon. So macro photography is um, great for close-up images of plants. And to acro activate macro photography, there could be a, on your phone or camera, there could be a flower icon that you might want to highlight or turn the dial to. And that will allow you to um, essentially take really close images. <clears throat> for DSLRs, SLRs, and mirrorless cameras, you need to have a, um, a lens that allows you to have macro. So um, in that picture, that is my SLR lens and it has a macro option, but you have to um, physically like push a button down to turn it so it's in a different section of the lens itself. It's very, very strange, I don't know. It's very old too, it's like probably as old as I am. And um, so once you get into macro mode, you, what you want to do is you want to get as close as you can to the subject and try to focus it. So you might want to get close and then move a little bit further and further until the image becomes sharp and clear. So um, if you're going to be doing this with a, um, a lens, like a bigger lens, like the one in the picture, you ideally you would use a tripod because it, it tends to um, uh, get blurry a lot. Longer lenses have less stability. And then macro photography, of course, if you're taking a very small detailed close-up image isn't ideal if you're going to be recording images of larger plants and the whole plant structure, but it is, ideal if you want to identify pests, um, disease issues, and new growth. So here's some images of macro photography. So obviously the dandelion, you can see the seeds, which is one of the things that people like to use macro photography for is getting like really detailed close-ups of flowers and seeds and um, systems that we can't see with our naked eye. Okay. So um, when you're photographing plants for identification, you want to think about um, what you want to, how you want to frame your plant and um, your intentions on like getting it identified. So for example, is it like a strange flower on the plant? And you're like, I, I want to look at, like, look at the flower as a key to identify what the plant is? Or do you want to look at the whole plant or does your plant have a disease on a leaf and you want to specifically look at the, the leaf and um, inquire with somebody else? These are things that you want to really think about when you're um, photographing for identification. And then what kind of features are you including in the image? So are you taking photos that show the, the edges of the leaf? Are you taking um, photos that show the structure of the plant? Are you showing the um, flower and seeding process? Are you sh showing the root system? These are um, different features of the plant that you might want to take photos of if you're doing identification. Um, one thing I, I find important personally is the true color of the plant. So, um, Plants come in all sorts of colors. Like <laughs> my personal favorite are purple plants. So purple broccoli and purple kale. I just, I love the purple and we were talking about purple plants earlier. You guys know I love purple plants. So like, it's really important to also identify the true colors of the plants in the, photo in the photograph. So make sure it's accurately represented. This is really difficult if you take photos in the shade, the photo the images will tend to come out more blue. It'll be more hard to color correct. And it, like if your plant has a disease, if its leaves are turning yellow, 
it might be more hard to identify it if the colors aren't correct. So um, do you, one of the questions is, do you need to change your white balance to correct for lighting? So a lot of these cameras um, will have options in their color balance to correct for shade, to correct for um, cloudy days, and to correct for um, direct sunlight. I don't think any cameras have um, the golden hour setting, but who knows, maybe in the future. And then um, you also really do want to take photo like different angles, <laughs> different photos, different angles, um, different perspectives of the plant to really um, give a range if you're trying to go for, let's say, a, an identification on a website. If you're uploading images, you really want to give your viewers a really good idea of like what the plant looks like. You might not have the, if you upload one, one image, it might not give the best picture. And then um, really very important for identification is scale. So how large or small is the plant? And to get a good sense of scale, people often include um, other objects in the image. So um, I recommend using a measurement tool. You can use a ruler. Um, seed packets often come with a little um, measurement on the back. So you can probably use a seed packet as well. Um, if not, you can use coins for small plants or for larger plants, use a human hand or a human body for scale. Um, I have seen a lot of people using bananas, but you know, bananas seem pretty, uh, everyone knows the size of a banana. So that seems like it works. Whatever, whatever you use to use a sense of scale, make sure it's an object that has one uniform size that is easy to recognize from people, from anyone, like a Campbell soup can, that's pretty, everyone knows how big that is. You don't really ever see big ones, right? So this is an example of scale. Um, the picture on the right isn't exactly the best for like how, how large is the plant, how, how large are those leaves? It's just very, very vague. But the picture on the right, um, it shows it compared to my hand, the size of my hand. So like that gives a, a good um, reference. So um, photographing plants for documentation, doc, yeah, documentation, records and research. So what I personally do as a gardener is every year I actually do a like photo journal of the plants I'm growing. And every year I like to look at the, the different, um, like, oh, what plants did I grow last year? And like, how did they turn out, let's say, um, are my tomatoes growing early this year versus last year? And um, how I can use um, these photo journals to actually help, help me as a gardener. <clears throat> so um, time-lapse photography is helpful, helpful for these types of things. So time-lapse photography takes a photo, let's say one photo every second, or you can change it so it's one photo every 15 seconds, or it's one photo every one hour or one photo every day, like you can have a different um, scale of time-lapse and then you can um, put them all these images together and it kind of creates like uh, a video or like it, it gives you a sense of time and scale. It's, it's really cool. I, I love doing time-lapse photography. And then so <clears throat> um, you also want to consider the intent again. Um, why are you taking these photos? Um, if you're going to be like, for me as an artist, a lot of my work is actually doing research and documentation for future projects. And that includes taking a lot of photos of plants. And so when I'm taking photos of plants, I try to take as many as possible because I don't know what I'm looking for in the future. I just know that I'm, this is something I'm interested in. This is something that might help me down the road. And so you want to also think about the intent as in like, what kind of details do you want in the image? If you're going to be doing like a scientific diagram, you might want to have the whole structure of the plant, like the, the roots, the, the stem and leaves and the flowers and seeds. 
it, these are things you really want to consider when you're um, documenting plants. And then also um, you want to consider um, how plants could also reflect different spaces and different geographic locations. So um, the photo on the left there, I actually took when I was in Flagstaff, Arizona, just um, enjoying how different all the plants and nature was just in that geographic region, how different it is from where I am in Metro Vancouver. Just for me, it's very fascinating and it's um, documenting plants is almost like docu documenting, um, I don't know, the cultural identity of the place. So for me, it's, it's really important when I go traveling to take photos of all the plants. <laughs> I love taking photos of plants, guys. Um, so artistic photography of plants. Uh, so <laughs> the emphasis with artistic photography would be on high contrast, low depth of field photos. So um, very small um, parts are in focus. And minimalism. So um, yeah, just not a lot going on in the photo. There is little consideration on representation and identification of the plant. Instead, the focus is on the mood and beauty, the aesthetics of the image itself. And so colors, contrast, and weather are all very important in um, contributing to the mood of the image. And so um, essentially all the rules that I just like laid out ahead, you can just throw out the window, <laughs> just, um, I think with artistic photography, there are essentially no rules. You just, how you feel as a creative person out there in the world with your camera in your hand, that is, that's art itself. So some things to consider with artistic photography are um, the rule of thirds. So with the rule of thirds, your, um, your image is split into thirds and then you'll have your subject at one of the, third lines, so it's like a grid. Dynamic symmetry and symmetry, so um, how light and dark plays together, um, negative and positive space play together, repetition and pattern, and then the golden ratio and the golden spiral. These are all like very classical art historical ways of composite, like composing images and how to make for um, aesthetically pleasing images. They're just like essentially little tricks. So more things to consider is what is your, your goal with photographing, photographing plants? Is it so you can do a scientific diagram? Is it so you can be artistic? And then when you're um, doing this, how does the lighting help your goal? So if you're going to be doing, let's say, a good documentation photograph of a plant that you're interested for a scientific diagram, you might want to go outside on a cloudy day where the colors are more true versus having that like high contrast sunny day with like a very low depth of field image, which would be more of the artistic side. So the background, this is really, really important if you're, especially if you're getting identification for plants and just having a really good photo is what's in the background of the photo and does it distract from the subject? So if you do have a distracting background, is there, can you move around your subject and get a different angle that isn't as distracting? Can you um, change your focus? So there's a short, like a smaller depth of field. So whatever's in the background isn't, isn't clear, as clear as the subject itself. And then um, consider the colors and how the colors will um, either take away or just distract from the subject. So um, also shadows, if you're doing plant identification, shadows, it's, it's really important to get an accurate image of leaves and um, structures. So how do shadows 
um, distract or alter the plant's appearance. This is really important with um, outdoor photography in direct sunlight. So a lot of shadows can actually create like weird shapes that aren't true to the plant. And also how do shadows alter the colors of the plant? And um, do the shadows help or do they hinder the, the end product? So like these are all things to consider and to drive my point home here some. But yeah, these, these are photos from my balcony and um, not ideal. You can see way too much in the background. It doesn't really show what the plant or the subject is. It's, um, yeah, in my opinion, meh, not, not great photos. And so final thoughts, um, take as many photos as you possibly can, you know, um, go through them after, zoom in, <laughs> make sure you zoom in and get rid of the photos that aren't helping you at all. But take as many as you can, as many as your um, storage device will allow. And yeah, try different angles, try a range and try different exposures, play around, just have fun with different, um, different light. <clears throat> um, <laughs> Always make sure your memory card has space. So continuously um, download your photos or upload them. Um, don't, don't get into the situation where you go outside and you're like, oh no, memory card full. That is, uh, that's such a bummer. And also same thing goes for your battery. Make sure your battery is charged. Um, you know, if you're like, I'm gonna go out for a walk tomorrow with my camera, make sure you charge your battery the night before and make sure to put your bag together. Um, another tip, if you're gonna go out in the field and take photos, bring some water and a snack and dress for the weather. That's really important. You don't wanna go outside and be like, oh, I'm boiling hot or I'm like freezing cold and I have to go inside. Um, you know, be prepared and avoid touching the plant. We're trying to uh, appreciate it through our eyes, through our devices. Um, especially if you don't know what the plant is, don't touch it. Um, if you don't have gloves, don't touch it. Uh, if you do need to touch the plant, make sure you have gloves, make sure you know what the plant is. There are harmful plants out there and a lot of people have allergies they don't even know about. Just make sure you err on the side of caution. And lastly, don't overthink plant photography. Just go out there and take some photos. Uh, it's just have fun and experiment. Just there's no bounds to photography. You don't have to go to school to be a great photographer. You just have to go out there and have fun. That's it. And with that, thank you very much. And I hope you all enjoy, if you're in Metro Vancouver, the great weather. And you know what? In an hour, it's going to be the golden hour. So I hope some people go outside and take some great photos. Thank you so much. That was so great. Thank you, Crystal. I, uh, I receive a lot of uh, emails with people sending me photos of plants they want to identify. And I wish everybody could take your workshop because sometimes the photos are really a barrier to me um, being able to identify things properly. So that was just great. Um, we do have a few questions. Um, first one from Melinda, and I think it came in when you were talking about the uh, DSLR, SLR mirrorless cameras. Is there a difference in picture quality between the cameras? Oh, no, 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 no. Um, they're all, I would say um, DSLRs, SLRs, well, actually, ignore SLRs. DSLRs, mirrorless, and um, like even like iPhones, like tablets, they're all like, pretty much on the same base level of having like really high megapixel um, numbers and just being amazing cameras. However, I want to just note that um, the industry standard for having like the best photos is film. That yeah, digital is still like way behind in detail quality when it like compared to film. 
And then a, I think it's more of a comment from Nelson. I think that would have come maybe a slide or two after you were talking about the different types of cameras. I think the sensors in both will be very similar. The difference will mostly be in features and form factor. Um, a question from Jan, would you please ask Crystal for a hint of the icon or the symbol that you would find on a DSL camera that will change the f-stop so that she can blur the background? Hold on, I'm just checking on my camera now. I just, I'm, I just use my camera so like uh, seamlessly. So I was just, uh, where are you f-stop? Okay, so it would just have an F. I, um, I don't know if you guys can see up in the top, there's an F and it's highlighted. Did you see that? It, it is literally an F. And um, so some cameras have a, um, they'll have a scroll on the top for your shutter speed. And they might have a second um, scroll that would control your aperture. Or in the case of my camera, there's actually a wheel on the back that controls the aperture. Mm -hmm. But to control your aperture, you have to make sure your camera's in manual mode. Can I, can I ask you to show me the back of your camera again, please? And show me, just point to those, because I, I missed um, when you showed it. Yeah. Thanks. Hold on. Hold on. Yeah. You see that? Where it says F22? Yes. Okay, thanks. Thank you. I'll look for that. If you have any like um like an image of your camera and you need some help, um maybe we could sort that out after. It's thanks. Thank you. All right, next question. Do you have any suggestions for a great uh, plant ID app? I actually have some suggestions that I'll pop into the chat. These are um, apps that most of them are free. A lot of them use, um, you know, you submit a photo into the database of the app and it cross references your photo with, um, you know, literally millions of plants from around the world that have been documented and then it'll kind of um, spit out what it thinks that your plan is. And some of them like iNaturalist actually use community scientists like us who are also on iNaturalist who can help verify the ID. But um, do you have any uh, recommendations, Crystal, for apps that, that you use? I've only used iNaturalist. Um, they actually were the ones that helped me with the Queen Anne's Laced identification last year. And yeah, it was like, I, I had not a very good image either. So I'm quite, uh, oops, it was just one leaf and someone just like, they knew exactly what it was just by that leaf. I guess the leaf is that interesting, but <laughs> yeah, I really recommend iNaturalist. Yeah, iNaturalist is great. Um, and a lot of these apps are free, although sometimes there are in-app purchases or there are limits to how many times you can use it in a month or a certain period of time before they start charging you. Um, but you can kind of get to see which ones might work for you. And, and I actually learned about a lot of these apps from friends that I have that have no background in, you know, biology or plant identification and, you know, sort of like the lay person has had really good success with them. So it's a great, um, great thing to recommend to people that should learn more about plants. Um, Finally, I just did want to share that link again to um, more information about this workshop series. So if you're not registered for the Botanical Illustration Workshop in June, we really hope to see you there. I think we covered all of the questions. There's lots of kudos to you in the chat, Crystal. Um, a lot of thanks. And yeah, just my thanks from the ISCMV and all of us here tonight for sharing your knowledge. This was a really great kind of summary of photography stuff. I know people can take workshops and courses and even specialize in it in post-secondary like you did, but this is a really nice way to kind of get a summary and an overview. So thank you. And to all of you, I wish you luck in taking 
good plant photos because we'll be looking for them come the summertime when we design our um, plant guidebook. So please get out there. The golden hour is going to start fairly soon. So good night, everybody, and thank you for joining. Mm -hmm.